Okay, so let's get started uh, from where we left in the previous uh, video. Uh, if you remember, we were trying to talk about uh, different ways of doing the dose response, the, those calculations that we were uh, trying to do. So if you remember in terms of the calculation that we were uh, looking at, uh, just to recap very quickly, we were looking at the potential factor for carcinogen, chronic daily intake. So all these, you see all these formulas, all these values that will come. For that, we need to con find out the concentration. So we need to know the concentration data. Then only you can use those formulas, isn't it? You need to know what is there in that environmental sample. And in terms of uh, things coming from the what solid phase to liquid phase, we need to know the concentration which is present. So in this particular lecture, we will try to talk about how we get those concentration. Uh, if some of you have, if, if you have taken uh, either of my previous NPTEL courses, there also we have talked about that. So it could be a repetition, but again, this is relevant for this course. So we'll talk about in terms of uh, when, how we get this environmental concentration and how we use the data. So let's start with this and then depending on the time we can get to some other topic within this particular video. So in terms of, in terms of the determination of concentration, usually for if it's an air sample, what we'll do, we'll, we'll do a uh, air sampling. Using an air sampler, we can find out how much is there. You always hear about particulate matter 2.5, PM10 or uh, SOX or NOX, how those data comes. So you always, always try to uh, try to understand that uh, for first of all, why we need that data and I think we have explained that good enough. Then how the data is collected, that is very important to know because if there is a, something wrong with the data, say tomorrow you become a uh, in charge of a city uh, where you are looking at the pollution for, for one particular city or for a state or even a country or global whatever, if you do not understand the data collection properly and then you cannot really pinpoint what could be the potential error in the data because if you have the bad data, you, all those calculations that we did in the previous video uh, will, will have the bad numbers. So to have a proper data collection is always needed. So let's look at how they are done. So in terms of the air pollution, we generally determine using some sort of air sampler. So we'll have the air sampler at the site and uh, the air sampler will get those uh, air, will pass through that and there is a mechanism, we will not worry too much about what mechanism is there, that is the analytical chemistry people who will worry about that, but uh, there is a mechanism through which uh, that is uh, the data is, uh, is in extracted. So when the, say if this is one sensor, I am trying to pass a air through that or if you, if I pass through an air, like let us keep it like this. So I am passing an air from here and it will come out from this side. So while the air is passing through this particular, many times we call them a column or some sort of filter and then I can separate those contaminant. Then I can have, I may have a detector that when I separate the contaminant, it may react with the media present here. The, with the reaction of the media, a, a, sense, a uh, response will be generated and I can measure that response and looking at the intensity of the response, I can correlate that response with the concentration of that particular contaminant. Just to explain you in a simple way, it's, uh, it, there are a lot of, uh, of, of course, there is a lot of other things that goes in there and these things with this, uh, you have your computer, you have your software, so you can control many of things that is happening over, you can even have the frequency of collection, you can set it up to a data logger where data can be directly transmitted to that particular uh, data logger. From data logger, you can use it, you can even download it on your uh, smartphone using an app. So a lot of things is possible and those things are being done in different places depending on how much money you want to spend and how much, uh, what is the severity of the situation. So concentration of pollutant, we have to, these are the ways uh, like for the air pollution. For the water, what we are usually worried about is uh, if things are in, one of, the, one of the things that we worry about things coming to the water phase, if, the, if there is a contaminant in the solid phase, if there is a contaminant which is present in the solid phase, whether it will come to the water. In terms of the hazardous waste per, uh, scenario, we try to de determine using what is known as a TCLP test. So TCLP test is essentially is trying to find out if a hazardous waste when it is put in a landfill like municipal solid waste landfill condition, whether it will create uh, uh, with what, what is the amount of uh, leach, uh, concentration which will come from the solid phase to the liquid phase. And when it comes to the liquid phase, in the event that there is a breakage in the liner. Uh, that leachate will percolate through the ground 
and can potentially contaminate the groundwater. So that's the that's the scenario of TCLP. But TCLP is uh, we use TCLP protocol was developed earlier. We do lot of other leaching tests today. TCLP is just simulating what will happen in a landfill. It does not simulate what will happen in a say outside a landfill environment when the rainwater is the it's the water which is in contact with this with the solid waste. So in that scenario, we do other testing, but more or less uh, nowadays for most of the batch testing procedure, most not all, uh, we use that the basic concept we use the same, the leaching fluids keeps on changing. So let us look at how this TCLP is done and then I will try to explain how the other tests differ from here and when we use what kind of test to find out the concentration especially in the water phase when we are worried about uh, things moving from electronic waste as a solid when it goes to the liquid phase. So, this is one example, example procedure in terms of how uh, waste is uh, uh, like a leaching is done. So, you have a solid waste in our case this will be electronic waste. So, here you have a solid waste. Uh, so, this will be in our case it will be electronic waste. Now, we have to size reduce to less than 1 centimeter. Now, to reduce this is what the protocol requires. You have to reduce the size to less than 1 centimeter. But think about uh, electronic waste. You have a CPU. CPU has a steel. CPU has plastics, CPU has a lot of wires, CPU has painted wireboard, motherboard, uh, RAM, all those different things are there. Now, how will you size reduce it to less than 1 centimeter? It is it's very, very tedious job and uh, if you reduce it to less than 1 centimeter, there is always a argument that why? Why we need to reduce it to less than 1 centimeter? Because that will never happen in the environment. So, why this less than uh, reduced reduction less than 1 centimeter is still there in any of these uh, regulatory, this is a regulatory test, this is a, a test which is required as per regulation. So, why it is there? The reason it is there and of, of course, when it was made e-waste was not there in the picture, e-waste is a recent phenomena, this things was developed, the TCLP test was developed in our, like early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. So, at that time e-waste was not there. So, they were not uh, looking at e-waste in terms of making this test, but since this is the regulatory test used for other uh, waste, it is also used for electronic waste. The stuff, there is a challenge here, challenge in terms of how to get the representative sample. So, as I said, you have metals, you have plastic, you have casing, you have pipes, uh, sorry, you have uh, uh, like a, a wires and then uh, different types of wires, you have a motherboard, uh, uh, your other component. So, when you have this whole thing together, first of all, how to take this 100 gram? What is the basis of taking this 100 gram? Like uh, whether if I take all this metals, I do not include any of those uh, uh, circuit board, will it, it will not be a representative sample. If I take those entire circuit board, that also is not a representative sample. So, we have to decide how to take a representative sample. One approach for that is to do is take the weighted average. So, you, what you do, you take your CPU, break it apart and then you weigh the different components and in the same proportion you take the waste to make a total waste of 100 grams. So, that is one way to do it. The, but again, as the regulation requires you to less than 1 centimeter, so you have to do it actually, otherwise it is not a true TCLP. Uh, but then there are uh, alternatives which we will talk about that. Uh, you will see that we can go for uh, even we don't have we can go for test which we can which will be essentially will be similar to TCLP test and maybe more realistic but may not be uh, but doesn't have to be do the size reduction but that's always a challenge but why we do this size reduction of less than one centimeter the reason for that is to increase the surface area so as you can see this is smaller smaller pieces this is smaller pieces has a bit, bit more if you add up all the surface area here that is actually greater than the surface area of uh, this particular uh, total 100 grams over there. So, why surface area is important again? More the surface area, more the reaction, better the reaction that means more leaching will take place, more contaminant can go from the solid phase to liquid phase. Remember these are the regulatory test. So, regulatory test means you have to be, you try to predict the worst case scenario. You are always trying to find out in the worst case scenario what can potentially happen. So, you are trying to be as conservative as possible in terms of uh, predicting the potential environmental uh, pollution coming from the disposal of these electronic waste or any waste for that matter.
So once you have the size reduction of less than one centimeter, you leach it for 100 grams at, uh, at 18, uh, 18 hours at 30 RPM. Now again, why this leaching? Uh, again, we are try what we are trying to do is we are in, the, in terms of, as I said, 30 RPM, 30 revolutions per minute. So you are let letting it tumble. You are letting it tumble uh, for 30 in a, in a, it's a, it's a, basically it's a rotator. So it keeps on rotating at 30 RPM. And uh, so why would do that? To increase again the contact. We want maximum reaction to take place. We want whatever the things in the solid phase, whatever could possibly come to the liquid phase, we want them to come to the liquid phase so that we can have a more conservative estimate of potential environmental pollution. So once you have uh, that, uh, then you uh, filter. Uh, filtering is done. Uh, filtering where uh, we are filtering solid with the leachate. What we are interested in this part, because uh, this is, even if it is there, if, if, why? If we are interested in the liquid phase, the water concentration, what we are interested in, what is whatever is present in this part, and then we analyze the leachate and get the using some instrument, and that it can get a concentration of say certain milligrams per liter. Now this concentration is important in terms of looking at what is the potential risk. What is the potential risk of uh, uh, having this electronic waste in a scenario where the, we have this uh, x milligram per liter of say lead? Because lead is the one of the most common uh, 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 contaminant that we always encounter in terms of electronic waste. So we are always worried about like what is this lead concentration uh, which will come out in the liquid phase and then it can contaminate the surface water or potentially groundwater and all that. So this is how a typical leaching test is done. Now for the TCLP test, for the TCLP test what we do, TCLP again what, what, what is the TCLP test? It is called toxicity characteristic leaching procedure. When we do it, where we do it to find out whether a solid waste is a hazardous waste or not. There is a hazardous waste, uh, especially for a for the toxicity characteristic. There are other characteristics out there. That that's TCLP is not the only test for hazardous waste determination. There are a lot of other things that goes there in hazardous waste determination. But for the toxicity characteristic, especially from the heavy metal and organics too, but most from an electronic waste point of view, it's mostly the heavy metals that we are worried about. And most number one is lead that we are worried about. Of course, we have cadmium, arsenic, and other things are also there. But in terms of the lead leachability. In the TCLP test, uh, what we are trying to predict is if we take this electronic waste and put it in a MSW landfill, which was the municipal solid waste landfill, whether the lead concentration or the contaminant concentration, other contaminants as well, whether those contaminant concentration that will come to the leachate is, uh, is, is a high enough. So in case there is a breakage in the liner, whether that will go and contaminate the groundwater. So that's the whole rationale behind TCLP test which was explained in great detail in the solid waste class that we offered on NPTEL last uh, semester. So those videos are also available on public domain I mean, on YouTube. So in case of uh, uh, this, um, um, so once we have this concentration, we can predict whether it's, it's, it's potentially harmful or not. So, so, in term, so one thing I haven't explained to you yet, if you go back and look at this particular uh, is, uh, like a schematic, uh, one thing which I haven't explained in, is in terms of here I said leach 100 grams for 18 hours at 30 RPM. Now when we say leach, if you remember, if you see the picture here, we have a liquid. Now what is that liquid? Is it just a normal water, or what kind of what kind of liquid we will use to simulate different conditions? TCLP test, since it is to simulate the worst case scenario in a MSW landfill, we are looking at an MSW landfill, municipal solid waste landfill. There we try to, the liquid that we have here is essentially uh, so like acetic acid. So from this side, uh, let's see, let's clean it up a little bit. So we'll have, so the liquid that is what we are using it over here is acetic acid, CS3COOH plus sodium hydroxide and it's a buffered solution with a pH of 5.5. 9.3 plus minus 0.05 because you cannot have an exact pH, so this is the pH value. So pH is around 5.93 plus minus 0.05 and it is a mixture of CSCO3 plus sodium hydroxide. Now again, why acetic acid? Why acetic acid? Because municipal solid waste landfill, 
what we have municipal solid waste landfill mostly organic matter organic matter which would be non organic is not really creating much difficulty there it is the organic matter so organic matter once it degrades will produce some acid and ultimate acid that is produced is the acetic acid so if you remember from any wastewater class that you have taken hydrolysis acidogenesis acetogenesis and then you have the methanogenesis so acetogenesis produces you the acetic acid now the acetic acid is there in the municipal solid waste landfill that's why we are using acetic acid over here so just to simulate that condition then why sodium hydroxide sodium hydroxide is added just to make it a buffered solution now what is a buffered solution buffered solution that means is you have uh, uh, in buffered solution you are trying to have uh, buffered means resistance to ph change so we want a ph of 5.93 oh sorry it's 4.93 uh, sorry I, uh, that is not 5.93 it's a 4.93 it's 4.93 plus minus 0.05 sorry for that so so it's 4.93 see anybody can make mistakes so <laughs> so don't feel bad if you make a mistake always learn from mistakes so it's uh, 4.93 plus minus 0 0.05 that's the ph that uh, we use so uh, we what we are trying to do is sodium hydroxide is added to make it a buffered solution as you know so it's, uh, acetic acid is a weak acid it doesn't have much buffering capacity so that's why we add sodium hydroxide to have a buffered acid sol buffered solution at 4.93 pH, you so that's the liquid that is used in here. Now, if we want to use the same, let's clean it up so that. Uh, so, if you want to use uh, similar procedures in some other tests, say if you want to use what will happen outside the landfill, what uh, then this liquid has to change, because acetic acid sodium hydroxide was for municipal solid waste landfill condition. Now. If I'm interested in to see what will happen with a natural rainfall, now re natural rainfall, what is there? If you think about natural rainfall, just just before we talked about the air pollution, there I mentioned as well. One of the things that we worried about from the natural landfall is, uh, uh, which can potentially come down with the rainfall is socks and NOx. Now socks and NOx means what? Sulfuric acid, nitric acid. and they simulate acid rain condition that the acid rain condition if you want to simulate that's what you have so in terms of acid rain condition what uh, here the liquid that we will use to simulate those kind of uh, is a diluted solution of sodium hydroxide uh, h2so4 and hno3 so everything is there there is a logic for everything again i keep on telling in my classes online offline all, all the time don't try to memorize try to understand Memorization, we will forget the day your exam is over, or uh, what, and that, but if you try to understand, it will be with you for a longer period of time. And even if you forget something, you can all, once you come back and re revisit, it is quick to reco recollect. But memorization stuff doesn't, is not really quick to recollect. So always uh, try to understand the concept. So that's more important. So I think that's, uh, then we can have for other type of uh, leaching, so leaching conditions, we can have other liquids being used. We'll not worry about that for uh, right now. Uh, we'll, as we, if, if needed, we'll talk about that later in your, when you try to understand something else, you'll see that too. So difficulty of performing a TCLP is collecting a representative sample and size reduction. As I said, less than once uh, centimeter. It's very difficult to do that. So how, what we do typically? Uh, one option we try to do is we cut it by hand. Option one is you try to cut everything by hand. Uh, it's a, so you have your CPU, you disassemble, uh, you have different components in here. And uh, so disassemble different components and then you try to size reduce by hand. Oops, sorry, just a minute. Uh, so you have, you are trying to size reduce using different types of uh, like a size reduce by hand, which is not an ideal scenario, but you may have to do that. Use these uh, tools to get that. And here is your sieve to make sure the size is less than one centimeter. So it's actually one one dimension has to be less than one centimeter so that it can pass that sieve. So that's not all the dimension has to be there. So it basically you can make a long long strips of uh, width is less than one centimeter. But thinking about that, you may think that that's are you going to going crazy? Will this really happen in a, in a natural scenario? 
we say if I put this uh, e-waste in the municipal solid waste landfill, whether it will really break it down to less than one centimeter, that uh, typically will not happen. Then the question is why you are even making me do that? So that they are trying to make you do that, the regulation is trying to make you do that as I was trying to explain earlier as well to make it a worst case scenario. So that we, we, this, is the, this is the worst thing that can potentially happen. 99.9% .9 time probably it will not happen. So then the discussion also comes that something which will not happen, you know pretty much that it will not going to happen why you are, because you are increasing the cost. So why you are even doing this? So, but since the regulation, as I said, the, when the TCLP tests were designed, e-waste was not in picture. This kind of waste is used for, uh, uh, this kind of test is used for several industrial waste like ash, contaminated soil, and they are already have uh, low particle sizes. But since now this e-waste and other stuff, we may have to design a newer test. But until we have those tests, we work with what is the existing test. So it does act as a screening tool, but it may not give you the very good true picture, which you will see as well that many times it doesn't do that, uh, which uh, we'll uh, talk about uh, uh, as we make progress. So, so that's one way of doing it. And now the, what is the other way of doing it? You can grind it. So you can put it in a grinder like this. So you take your e-waste and uh, take it to a grinder and then you grind it uh, in here and so the grinder will give you some, some, some size reduction. Then you do the further size reduce by hand as we done in the previous slide and then you get your sample and you work with that sample in terms of the different leaching test. So that's another option uh, for us to try. So then what else we can do? Another option is we can, uh, we can let's uh, leach the whole thing. Because think about if when the electronic waste get disposed, especially in a landfill setting, what will happen? You have, you have broken down the e-waste, it, when compactor passes on top of that, it may crush it a little bit. But other than this, you don't expect things to break down, like metals, plastics, they will just stay there. Over time, there will be some wear and tear. But you don't get less than, less than one centimeter. So in that case, one option is, let's take, let's just disassemble. So you take the electronic waste, and then just disassemble them. You disassemble them, oops, sorry. You disassemble them, and then you try to uh, find out the concentration. Uh, you try to try, try to get the concentration in here, in terms of uh, uh, you, after you pass it through. But that in that case, you need a much bigger vessel. You need a much bigger vessel than what is typically used for the TCLP test or this leaching test. So with that uh, in mind, that kind of gives you some idea of how uh, the different types of leaching could potentially be done. And why we are again, why we are doing this leaching stuff? To get the data. We have to collect the data to, and that data will be useful in doing those cancer risk, non-cancer risk and all those calculations. So what I did is I just give you a very quick overview of how the data is collected. And then uh, let's, let's try to look at, once you have the data, how will you try to make use of that? So we have to look at uh, what are the, whether that uh, contaminant is a carcinogen or non-carcinogen. If it's a non-carcinogen, we do the calculation in a slightly different way. If it's a carcinogen, the calculation is done in a different way. The carcinogen, we have to be more careful. So for the non-carcinogen effect, uh, we assume that there is an exposure threshold. So uh, what is an exposure threshold? It is the amount, it is the concentration uh, above which you, will, you start seeing adverse effect, below which you don't see that. So that's your, uh, assume that non-carcinogen, there is an as, as exposure threshold. Any dose less than threshold would not increase the adverse effect. So lowest dose is which is known as the lowest observed adverse effect level, or we call it lowell. The highest dose that does not create a response is called no observed adverse effect, which is called a NOL. And then we can calculate reference dose uh, called by acceptable daily intake. We can find out uh, that indicates a level of human exposure, which is likely to be without acceptable risk. And you can, you can take the NOL values, which is the no observed uh, uh, adverse effect level. And then there is a, a small typo here, actually. Uh, this should be. N O E A L. This needs to uh, N O A E L, which is uh, no observed adverse effect level. So this is what needs to come here. So E and A got switched. So, so for the non-carcinogen, uh, uh, we take that novel value, and then 
we up, we use lot of uncertainty factor now why we use this uncertainty factor what is the why, what why we have to use this uncertainty factor the reason we have to use this uncertainty factor is since this data is always generated using mice guinea pigs and uh, uh, the, those species and we are talking about humans so when you have these mice and guinea pigs that is uh, being uh, used as the species to get these numbers get these numbers we we not not this one the, the other like no lowell and novel and other values so we have to try to uh, take that uh, mice and rabbit data and extrapolate it to what could potentially be the human data and that's your uh, in that case you apply certain uncertainty factor because you're moving from one species to another species so that's why we need to go those uh, exercise okay so once you have that uh, how we do that uh, once you have the data what we do with that we uh, we plot this with what is known as the dose response curve now dose response curve is your you have a uh, as you increase the so at a certain from here you are increasing of oh, sorry uh, just a minute so from here as you increasing the dose for one particular contaminant up to certain level there is no effect because up to certain level say most of this contaminant whether you talk about chromium or arsenic or other stuff we do use them a little bit we do use them in terms of a dietary supplement and all that when they go at a higher concentration then only it becomes a problem so at a smaller concentration you don't see any effect at from here you start seeing some impact showing up and then you start looking at uh, increase in the number so what you do is you'll take the no observed ef adverse effect level and this lowell is uh, actually needs to move to this side so that should be on this side so that's your uh, uh, this is no ob no effect here we start seeing effect so that needs to come just before this arrow that's where this uh, l o a e l needs to come and then when it goes above that you start seeing increase in in the response and then ultimately what happens it kind of flats out so it is starts so you if you can start from it will start from a, like an s and then this is the uh, on top like an s and the bottom s and the, so it's basically something like uh, you have uh, and we, i don't need to redraw that because it's right here so you have these then you start seeing the effect and then after a certain concentration things get starts flattening out so that's a call a typical s curve that's the s curve for the dose response we call it a dose response curve so that's your dose is in milligram per kilogram and the response could be the way we are measuring it so it's again just a quick uh, what are the other things here in you so lowell will be here so after lowell you start seeing an increase in effect and then it things gets plateau out and we calculate this reference dose which is actually much less than uh these values that we get so we are adding some uncertainty and then we are also adding some factor of safety there to get those uh, rfd values so that probably explains uh, the stuff and then we also talk about uh, hazard index and hazard quotient so maybe uh, uh we will uh, start let's see yeah probably let's let's do the slide here and then we'll, we'll close so that next we can talk about different uh, Uh, concept so in terms of the hazard index and the hazard quotient it's a, it's a, it's a terminology essentially it's used to in the hazard quotient is used to compare the actual exposure of of uh, with the R rfd to see whether the actual dose is safe or not so we will collect the data as i was trying to ma mention in the pre uh, the beginning of this particular video we'll collect the data we'll calculate the average daily dose we'll get the average daily dose during the exposure period we can get this data up from our collection and then we divided by rfd rfd has been uh, generated uh, over several years of research so this rfd value is now available for most of the common contaminant so if average daily dose divided by rfd if that number uh, is known as the hq which is the hazard quotient so hq is less than 1 that means uh, rfd is actually more daily dose is less so there is no significant risk of systematic toxicity but if hq is greater than 1 there are chances of potential risk so if in that case there is a chance of potential risk 
So when exposure involves more than one chemical, the sum of the individual hazard quotient is used to measure the potential toxicity, which is known as the hazard index. So we, if it's more than one chemical is there, we can put uh, things together and then we can find out what uh, it's a put, measure the total potential toxicity, which is also known as the hazard index. So HI is actually some of the hazard quotient. So hazard index is some of the hazard quotient and that's how we, we get these numbers. So this is the important concept in terms of the hazard uh, index and hazard quotient. So with that, let's uh, uh, stop in this particular video. So this is the fourth video of the second week and then we have, uh, uh, we'll have the last video coming up uh, for this particular week. And uh, so this is, uh, again, if you, in this particular video, what we try to learn, we try to learn, uh, first of all, in terms of the data, data quality, why the data is important, how it is, how we are going to collect it, different environmental sampling for that. And then you look at the procedure in little bit in detail of how we do it for the liquid uh, sample, uh, the concentration coming to the liquid phase from the solid phase, different scenarios, how to get a representative sample, and then we talked about this hazard index and hazard quotient. So with that, uh, let's uh, uh, stop now, and uh, in the next video, we'll continue this discussion, but with slightly different angle. So a different angle in terms of the bio concentration, biomagnification and all that. So again, thank you very much. Do uh, take the quiz and I, I would encourage you to take the exam. It's up to, of course, it's up to you. You have to register for the exam. The information probably will be given to you or maybe already been provided. So enjoy the course. Any question, send us a feedback, send us an email. Uh, sorry, send us a question on the discussion forum and we will respond to you. Again, thank you.